I'm very much privileged to be uh, the first speaker in uh, this series, which uh, I'm sure will be very successful. Um, as Manuel has already highlighted, I will tell you a little bit about the microbiome um, and uh, basically uh, focusing on microbial communities in and around us. And hopefully by um, the end of my talk, you will have a better understanding of what we understand under microbiomes, microbiota, microbial communities, etc. All right, so um, before I, I get into the nitty gritty and talking about uh, the microbial communities that concern us as humans in the context of uh, human and health and disease, I'd like to just broadly give you a glimpse into the reason why I um, started working on microbial communities. And uh, basically the general um, reason for this is that um, I um, did my PhD in environmental sciences. And the um, thing that sets our planetary system apart from others is the fact that throughout uh, evolution, since life uh, first occurred on our planet, basically we have been um, seeing the changes that have led to the world that we know today, mostly due to the activity of microbes. So although microbes are uh, in and around us, we can naturally obviously not make them out with the naked eye, but they rule the world and it's really that simple. So the reason that we have an Earth system that is self-regulatory in a lot of ways is due to microbes. If we look, for example, at the wiring diagram of our planet, um, here depicting basically different uh, chemical transformations that underlie processes that are uh, absolutely essential to make our planet hab habitable the way uh, we know it. If we look at uh, the vast majority of these uh, transformations, the, the, you see that, for example, uh, using um, molecular oxygen or uh, as highlighted here by O2, so um, the reactions um, mediated by this um, are fairly limited in contrast to all of the other elements that can be used, for example, in the context of, um, of oxidants. And so um, that just gives you a glimpse into the fact that um, without microbes, none of this would work. And without microbes, we would certainly not have a planet um, in the way we have it uh, as we know it. Right, so basically from, from this, um, you get a glimpse into that microbes are, of course, inherently important. They're not just important for different biochemical transformations, but as I will highlight in the following uh, slides, uh, they are also integral to our own health and well-being. And what is emerging now more and more is that not just in the context of uh, global change, where we are messing around with all of these different um, biogeochemical cycles, not just on the planetary perspective, have we affected our microbiota. We have also done so um, in and on ourselves through mostly changes in lifestyle, etc. So um, I have been studying microbial communities, as I mentioned, since I um, did my PhD. And um, just to give you a glimpse into the fact that I work primarily on environmental systems, it's only after joining the LCSB, uh, coming back to Luxembourg, so I'm originally from Luxembourg, coming back um, now uh, 10 years ago through an attract fellowship of the um, National Research Fund that I started working on the human microbiome, which at that time was just emerging as a known discipline. And so um, the point is that um, I've worked on a range of different uh, environmental samples before, as highlighted here. Uh, sampling in these systems is oftentimes much more dramatic, of course, compared to the majority of the work that we do now, which is focused, as I uh, mentioned already, on, on humans. So there, um, we wouldn't need to take a helicopter, of course, to go to the sampling site and, and take, in this case, uh, water samples from these individual ponds that you can just make out here. But I've also worked on uh, organisms, uh, for example, in the subsurface. So this is uh, a sampling um, a community that is basically around uh, 1500 meters underground. So um, and also there, microbes play an absolutely essential role. Um, and that is in the context of um, microbes that wouldn't have any um, light to make a living. 
So they are uh, very adaptable and they really occur everywhere on Earth. So ranging from, again, Antarctica, as highlighted by the broader picture, to the subsurface, um, in this case, uh, 1,200 meters underground. Okay, but the the aim of my talk today is really to educate you and, and to give you a bit of a glimpse into the human microbiome. So what do we understand under the human microbiome? Well, so basically, one has to say that this is a field that has grown only really over the last decade. And, and the reason that it has grown is because we have had, for the first time, really methods at hand to study the complex communities of microorganisms in and on us yeah, over this time. So before we were able to observe them, for example, using a microscope, but we were not really able to get really an understanding of the diversity and then also which functions they carry out. And so what we have really learned, I would say, over the last decade is that uh, the microbiome and in particular the gut microbiome, because it is in the gut that we have most of these organisms, that it is highly diverse. So. Um, Basically, we have on the order between 1,000 and 1,500 individual species of uh, microorganisms, and um, these can be bacteria that you uh, are probably all uh, familiar with. Uh, these might be viruses. They may, however, also be um, organisms that you would not necessarily associate with, with your gut, for example. These might be, for example, more exotic microorganisms such as archaea, which are um, also unicellular organisms similar to bacteria, but they are distinct from bacteria. And then we also, for example, have uh, funguses and other uh, microorganisms in the gut. And generally speaking, if we were to uh, do the numbers game and we would count all of the individual microbial cells just in the gut alone, we would uh, figure out that um, these number at least as many cells that we have constituting the human body, so human cells in that case. So it is um, a, a remarkable number, um, and it is, as I mentioned now, equivalent with the numbers of human cells that we have putting together our body. But importantly, in the gut, these organisms, they of course don't uh, exist just in a kind of bubble by themselves, but they interact. And through the interactions, for example, in the digestion of the food that you're currently consuming, I, if I'm looking at the pictures here, I can see that number of you are currently eating. So what you are setting off are, of course, a whole uh, cascade of different biochemical transformations that for the most part, at least in the lower gut, will be driven uh, by microbes. So they will take the complex, for example, dietary fiber that you're ingesting at the moment, and they will um, yeah, take this apart and make it available uh, for your own human cells then uh, to, to make a living. So the point there is that these don't um, exist in isolation. They interact with each other and through the interaction, for example, through uh, the metabolites that they might generate from the digestion of the food that you're consuming, they, they um, create these complex networks. And these networks uh, of interaction, they themselves confer essential functions. These essential functions range from, we've just touched upon it, digestion of foodstuffs, to, for example, um, stimulation of the immune system. So these functions are indeed absolutely essential uh, to us and our own health and well-being. But over the, the time, especially since the Industrial Revolution, we, we've been messing with this. And we've been messing with this not uh, through uh, our voluntary actions, but we've indirectly affected what has been going on, for example, in the gut because of the fact that we've done certain things. We've, since the end of the Second World War, we've, we've had antibiotics and we've been using these extensively across the whole human population. And this has had an effect. This has an effect in the sense that while we've seen a decrease in the numbers of acute diseases, in particular infectious diseases, what we have seen at the same time is an increase in chronic diseases. And I will come back to what possible links might exist there. Another way that we have affected uh, our gut 
uh, microbes is through um, changes in diet and, and mostly uh, moving towards uh, high caloric uh, diets and, for example, not consuming much fiber anymore. That has also had an important effect. And then, for example, we've also uh, been do doing a lot of unnecessary medical procedures that in turn also affect the microbes in the gut. And I'll give you a concrete example that we've worked on extensively. That is, for example, cesarean section, which has an effect in relation to the initial colonization of the gut by different microbes. And then we are, of course, still in the COVID-19 pandemic, and this is driven by an emergent pathogen because we have also, broadly speaking, we have been affecting microbes uh, not just within us, on our surfaces, but we've also been affecting microbes generally in the context of the environment in that we've been also exposing ourselves more to them. And so that has also a, an effect in the sense that we may find more uh, pathogens uh, that we will be exposed to as a species over the coming uh, years, decades, and um, um, yeah, further on. The point is that um, through all of these actions, we have uh, affected the interactions of the microbes in the gut. And what has emerged over, again, the last decade, because it is, again, just over the last decade that we've had the means to look at the microbes in the gut and, for example, compare healthy to individuals or patients with a given disease. And what has turned out is that there are differences in uh, the microbes, uh, not just in relation to which species you might have, for example, how much of a given E. coli organism you may have or other uh, bacteria, but we've also seen that, um, that there are differences in terms of the functions in the context of diseases. And so I'm just giving you here a whole range of, uh, of different diseases so these are all, all chronic diseases that have now been putatively linked to this change, or we oftentimes refer to it as an imbalance, or the technical term is dysbiosis for uh, these differences that are apparent in the context of all of the chronic diseases that I have listed here. And uh, in my talk today, I will just give you some concrete examples of diseases that we've worked on and that's cancer, diabetes, and also even neurodegenerative diseases uh, such as Parkinson's disease. So all of these diseases have, um, have shown or have been shown over the last decade to exhibit differences in the context of the microorganisms in the gut. And so how can we figure out what the underlying processes might be? So this is just a, a very... Um, easy to digest, again, <laughs> diagram, highlighting um, basically that you would have on the one side in the gut, you would have your microbes, you would then have basically the barrier that is constituted uh, first and foremost by mucus, and then underlying this would be intestinal cells, and then further underlying these would be immune cells. And so in the context of um, what, what we've seen is that um, by, by looking at healthy individuals, that is that um, in, in, in that context, there is an apparent balance between more beneficial bacteria and bacteria that might not be as well uh, to have in, the, in our gut uh, compared to those that, that would have beneficial functions. And so oftentimes we talk there about uh, facultative pathogens. So these are bacteria, for example, that under certain circumstances could become pathogenic. But at the same time, what is apparent is also that we have a balance in relation to our immune system. So uh, this is a, a situation which is not characterized by inflammation, for example. In contrast, in the context of a disease, and um, this has been uh, described, as I mentioned, for all of these chronic diseases that I've just highlighted, there is an apparent imbalance. And this uh, imbalance is characterized by an overgrowth of, of these not so good to have bacteria compared to the bacteria that we typically associate with more beneficial functions. And at the same time, what we see in all of those diseases, all of those chronic diseases is also inflammatory signatures. And so the, the question there is very much uh, over chicken and egg. 
and uh, whether in particular these imbalances may be actually causal in driving, for example, the inflammation as well as um, different other uh, processes that would culminate in disease. And I'll give you some uh, concrete examples of our work where we've also now made first inroads into showing that uh, specific molecules, for example, produced in such a scenario may actually be drivers uh, or even initiators of, of the disease. And so in order to really get at a, a concrete understanding, uh, because we want to answer this chicken or egg question. And so to answer that chicken or egg question, um, this is actually not a very easy proposition. This is entirely and highly complex because in the gut we have, as I mentioned, in any given individual, and uh, you are many now joining us here, so each of you will have on the order between uh, 1,000 and 1,500 individual microbial species. So if we see ourselves um, as a biological entity, we are one species, we're homo sapiens. So you need to think that we have this a thousand to 1500 times in terms of diversity in the gut alone. And importantly, these organisms can also be very distantly related from one another. As I mentioned, we have bacteria, we have fungi, and all of these organisms, they do produce their own biomolecules. So we have DNA, of course, we have RNA, we have proteins, and we have metabolites that are produced by these microorganisms. And uh, I'll give you some numbers later. Basically, in the gut alone, we have definitely in every individual that is uh, joining this, we have millions of different molecules being produced. And so now the big question is whether these imbalances lead to the production of a different spectrum of molecules that themselves are then, for example, initiators of a disease because of the fact that we have now these putative links, but we have nothing really concrete yet that would show us that, for example, such a change in the ecology in our gut would then be really the driver of the disease. So in order to do this, one has to have methods at hand. And so the methodologies that we have developed over the course of the last um, decade um, have allowed us to actually explore this vast space of molecules. And also importantly, we've been doing this in the context of healthy and diseased individuals to identify which differences might exist. And so what we do routinely is that we take samples from individuals and for the most part, these are, for example, stool samples. And then we extract using a robot that we've developed based on the methodology that in turn we developed. And I'll give you some insights on this. What we do is we um, uh, isolate DNA, we isolate RNA, we uh, isolate proteins and metabolites. So this is typically known as Crick's central dogma of molecular biology. So we're basically covering all of the levels of biological information. And the idea is that if we do this in a fully integrated and systematic manner, we should be able to get to the point of understanding again how these organisms interact, what are they using in terms of their interactions, in terms of what I oftentimes call a molecular currency. So what are they exchanging? And importantly, how do these interactions lead to specific spectra of molecules that in turn have an effect? And again, these molecules that are involved in these exchanges between the microbes themselves, but then also importantly, our own human body, they may be very different from another. And again, the, we have on the order of millions of distinct molecular currencies that would be involved in these interactions. But the key question is, of course, if you now have this imbalance again in the context of a chronic disease, how does a given molecule that might be the result of that, how does that maybe affect different cell types in our body? Because we don't have just a single cell type, of course, as highlighted here. We have different cell types, such as here epithelial cells that form part of the barrier, but we also have immune cells, we have neuronal cells, et cetera, et cetera. And it's quite likely that of course, these cell types will be different in terms of their susceptibility uh, 
to these different molecules. And that is exactly what we would like to understand because this kind of understanding is absolutely vital for us to unravel mechanisms between how changes again in the microbiota or the microorganisms of the gut, how they might then be initiators and drivers of a disease. And so why would we go, want to go through the, uh, the bother, in essence, that we've gone through um, of developing these methodologies? So basically, we have now a suite of different molecular methods available, and I'm not going to go into detail here, but I'd just like to highlight that for the most part, we talk about uh, rRNA gene amplicon sequencing or metagenomics, and these methods, they have been widely um, used to look at whether differences exist, again, between healthy and diseased individuals. But what we are really about is that what we really want to understand is function. We really want to understand how, again, these differences may lead to different molecules being produced that in turn may differentially affect our own body and how, in fact, they could trigger what is then down the road leading to a disease. And why that is important? Well, it is important because at each of the different levels that I just showed you, so DNA, RNA, proteins, and metabolites, at each different level do we have a different information content. And so basically by just looking at one dimension and extrapolating from that, you do not get uh, the entire picture. And it's absolutely vital that we get as complete a picture as possible because, again, we want to understand how the complex interrelationships, how these organisms talk to each other, how that may be perturbed in the context of a disease. So um, we have developed these methods. Uh, one method that I'm just highlighting here is to basically take a sample, for example, a stool sample from a patient. We immediately freeze this sample at a very low temperature, and then we have developed a proprietary technology for breaking the cells in this system or in, in the samples, and then isolating all of these different uh, molecules. So again, DNA that you've heard a lot about probably already, uh, RNA, proteins, as well as metabolites. And all of these individual fractions we're able to get out of a single sample. These are then analyzed with the latest high resolution um, molecular analysis methods. And then we have also developed all of the necessary computer programs, etc., to basically do uh, data integration. And what we call this is basically integrated multi-omics because um, omics uh, just refers to the fact that you're looking at in, 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 uh, with high throughput methodologies at a given molecular contingent, which might again be nucleic acids such as DNA or RNA, may also be other molecules. But the point here is just that we have developed all of these methods over the last years, and we have now a, a, a way of really going in the context of the data that is generated, and, and this is really what we would think of as big data, because there are typically millions of different, or millions and millions of different, um, um, basically, biological entities that we're able to resolve. And the aim of, in particular, the measurement, uh, along with then the uh, different computer programs that we have developed is to really go as um, any on any mass transit system, you obviously want to go from A to B. And our A is basically the, the raw data that we would generate based on all of the individual molecules that we would have extracted. And B is then the fully analyzed biological information. And then again, we would look at differences between healthy and diseased individuals. And so one aspect that I'd just like to cover, and I will not talk about this um, anymore, so you just have to bear with me uh, because this is our, so to speak, model system, which is not uh, uh, human. Well, it is human derived for the most part, but this is actually a community um, in a biological wastewater treatment plant that we've used a lot as our model system. And this is the uh, anoxic tank, as it's called, at the Schifflange wastewater treatment plant. So this is the wastewater treatment plant that actually treats the water from uh, Belleval. 
And we are specifically interested here for different reasons, also an applied biotechnological uh, reason in organisms that are here found at the air water interface of these anoxic tanks. And these are filamentous lipid accumulating organisms that by understanding more about their growth, we could think about enriching them in these systems and thereby extract lipids from wastewater and then um, synthesize this into biodiesel. So that is basically the applied biotechnological uh, basis of this project, but I'm not gonna go into detail. I just wanted to highlight um, that in terms of what holds methodology wise uh, in humans, holds methodology wise on environmental systems, for example, in particular, for example, this community, which is obviously of immediate relevance to the environment. But now coming back to humans, I took you on a brief excursion to the Chiflanche wastewater treatment plant. And now coming back to humans, so I talk a lot now about these imbalances. And these imbalances, they may occur throughout a human lifetime. They don't have to exist constantly. They may, but they may also not. And so the big question that we are faced with at this present moment is in particular in relation to chronic diseases, that obviously for the most part occur rather later on in life. And so the big question is um, because of the fact that certain influences can affect these trajectories um, very early on. And one of the major influences would be, for example, whether infants are uh, breastfed or not, whether they uh, have um, been subjected to, for example, uh, for birth uh, to cesarean section that I'll come to, etc. And so if we want to understand what happens in later life, it's absolutely vital that we understand what happens at the time, for example, of birth. It may also, of course, be that certainly a lot of the um, trajectories that we are set up on has have to do with host genetics. But what we are understanding now is that genetics is, of course, not everything. And for the most part, genetics cannot explain chronic diseases. So there are other things that are going on here. And so it's diet, for example, as well as the microbiome that is uh, affecting us very, very early on. And that may, in fact, set us up on trajectories that then later on culminate in these imbalances that themselves may then be the initiators of disease processes. And so understanding what goes on very early on in life has been one of the primary uh, questions that we've been interested in. And uh, we have been interested in particular the question whether, for example, cesarean section, whether that has an effect on the early colonization processes, because uh, all the evidence now suggests that uh, once you uh, leave the birth canal, you're still sterile, but you're then definitely immediately seeded uh, by microbiota. Uh, so it may still be from partially from the birth canal, but also uh, from other microbiota from the mother. And so um, that is, of course, something that does not necessarily occur in C-section. And so we were, for example, here interested in whether there are differences between C-section infants and those born vaginally. And what we had found very early on is that there are indeed uh, qualitative and quantitative differences for bacteria. Those are organisms that you've heard about, that you know. And then there are also differences for more exotic uh, microorganisms such as archaea and micro eukaryotes. And so, so in, in subsequent work, what we were very much interested in is to see whether also not just that there were differences in terms of the organisms that uh, you're seeded with, but also whether this might lead to functional differences and these functional differences, whether they may in fact affect uh, our own physiology. That's what we call the effect that it might have on, on our body. So here we were basically um, applying methodologies again that we developed from scratch. So these are both things that we do in the normal lab, but then also what we do on the computer. One element that we had found is because, for example, when we're dealing with um, samples from babies, these are very low in, in biomass, so there's only very little poop, I guess, you can collect from babies. 
And so we had to be aware of this because um, we wanted to make sure that the signals that we were recording were actually real. And so we had to deal with a lot of ways of removing, for example, contaminants uh, from any reagents that we used because we had previously found that this was an important artifact. So what we did was we developed the necessary methods to really get bona fide signals. And so then we were able to do a whole range of different analytics on the samples um, that I'm not going to go into detail with. I'll just show you what we found for the functions because in our mind, this is really the most interesting. So what we what we saw was that there were clear differences between infants born vaginally and those born by C-section. And that was uh, apparent at the levels of genes, but also functions. And what was also very striking is that the functions that were apparent um, in particular in the uh, vaginally delivered infants, those were much closer to those of, of the mother. So we also had uh, samples from the mother and in particular stool samples from the mother. What we saw very clearly was that uh, most of the functions from the mother were conserved primarily than in, in vaginally delivered infants. And so the question you will ask me, well, Paul, this is all nice and well that you are constantly telling me about these differences, that there might be differences in relation to organisms and functions, but what is that of relevance then to uh, health? So I'll just give you one example that we found to be different, and that was here, as, as it is highlighted, this is lipopolysaccharide biosynthesis. So this is a particular molecule that is produced uh, by bacteria, specific bacteria more so than others. And this molecule um, actually is very much known as an immunostimulant. So it basically triggers our immune system in a certain way. And so what we had seen was that there was this clear difference between vaginally delivered infants and those born by C-section. And uh, based on all of that, what I can tell you is that there is a difference in relation to the immune uh, system stimulation um, that occurs immediately after birth um, in, in the context of uh, C-section primarily. So what we found was that uh, at day five after birth, uh, you, you do see marked differences in how the immune system of um, the neonates is in fact stimulated. And so the question that then arises, I showed you this trajectory um, earlier, so whether these uh, differences then may affect us later on in life. And so we've um, had this cohort together with Karine de Beaufort now for quite a long time, and we are doing follow-ups. And the latest data that we've just published is on actually on the one-year time point. And what is very interesting is that um, in terms of the immune stimulation potential, um, there is not really uh, any clear difference anymore between the C-section delivered infants and those born vaginally. But what you can see here is that you have over time a difference in the C-section infants. So there is a difference nevertheless in terms of how they potentially react to not just the organisms in the gut, but other, of course, microorganisms as well. And so there is this question now, again, whether this early difference is setting these individuals up for differences in how their immune system, for example, would respond to microorganisms subsequently um, that they see in life. Another interesting uh, observation that we've, sorry, that we've been able to make has been on the question of antimicrobial resistance. Because, of course, um, we know that antimicrobial resistance is pr primarily prevalent in the hospital environment. And so we were interested in uh, seeing whether there might be already very early on also differences in terms of uh, organisms that might be resistant to antibiotics um, and whether there would be differences between C-section infants again, that are immediately exposed to the hospital environment compared to vaginally delivered infants. And what we found strikingly is, in fact, that there are differences very early on, again, in life. And a lot of these actually persist uh, over the first year of life. And so this is also very interesting because it um, opens up all kinds of avenues for possibly treating 
people with antibiotics later on in life according to whether they have, for example, been born by C-section or whether they have been born vaginally, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this uh, data is actually highly relevant uh, from a personalized medicine perspective. So now you've got uh, a taste for differences that may exist and that may um, be started, in fact, according to how you are delivered. Now I'll give you concrete examples uh, on diseases that we've looked at. I start with diabetes. So this was one of our first papers on the human microbiome. And we were specifically interested here in uh, type 1 diabetes um, and whether there would be differences in the microbiome. And so this was the first sort of report uh, in the literature because, again, we were able to cover all of these different uh, levels. What we had seen was actually that uh, specific microbial functions, again, those are the functions that are now kicking in uh, after you've eaten, for example. Um, and so we saw that there were concrete differences, for example, between healthy individuals and those with type 1 diabetes. And the striking revelation here, because previously in relation to these imbalances, people had always been looking, and they still continue to look mostly, uh, for differences uh, in relation to different organisms. And what we had seen was that there weren't necessarily differences in organisms, but that we saw differences in the functions. And this is a, a crucial, um, basically, uh, finding uh, that has been since been picked up uh, in, by the community also, because what we what we find is, in fact, that in the gut, we have these organisms, we have these possible differences also, but we have primarily a difference in, so this imbalance manifested more strongly at the levels of functions that are expressed. And, and these functions then, of course, affect our own body in different ways. And so what is clear from all of this data that we um, had published uh, four years ago now is really that the functions matter first and foremost. And again, this is something that is now um, being more and more picked up uh, by the community. And this has been uh, since been validated by independent uh, work also on type 1 diabetes, but is now being found in a lot of other disease contexts as well. Right, then um, I'd like to just uh, touch upon uh, Parkinson's disease. And, uh, you know that at ALCSB we have obviously a very strong focus on Parkinson's disease and, and you may now wonder why on earth we would look into Parkinson's disease given that this is what you would think a disease of the brain. Well, the reason is that in fact there, are, there have been a number of different hypotheses already for a long time on Parkinson's disease and that it may have something to do with the gut. And uh, I give you just a few lines of evidence here. So a truncal vagotomy, so this is basically the, the cutting uh, of the vagus nerve. So this is basically the, the neuronal connection between the gut. So in the gut, we have about a third of our uh, nervous cells or nerve cells. And it basically, you cut this because of different um, medical conditions, such as, for example, heart arrhythmia. And what has been found is if you do that, this actually decreases your risk of developing Parkinson's disease. Then what has also been seen is in the enteric nervous system. So those are the neurons that we have in the gut. And, you know, we've known for a long time that there is some kind of connection um, in relation to the gut and our own central nervous system in the sense that you have these sayings, a gut feeling and, and so on and so forth. And this comes from not, not from nothing. It is actually because of the fact that we have so many neurons in and around the gut. And so what is apparent in the nervous cells of the gut is that you have the molecular hallmarks of the disease. So these are these clumps of proteins within neuronal cells that are typically referred to as Lewy body inclusions, you have those very early on in the disease. And so basically, um, a German neuropathologist, Heiko Brack, he had basically come up with this hypothesis that um, Parkinson's disease, based on his intricate dissections of, of, the, of, of brains of uh, Parkinson's disease patients, um, that there are two likely uh, sources 
uh, or, or, or routes of entry of a so far unknown pathogenic agent. So this can be a microbe, for example, and that would be uh, the nasal cavity and or the gut. But this pathogenic agent may also be, for example, a molecule, a molecule that would be the result of these differences in functions in the microbes of the gut that that would, in, uh, would trigger the ensuing pathological process, which only at late stages would actually reach the brain stem and from there propagate out. So this has been now a working hypothesis in the field. What I should say is that we see these differences also uh, that I mentioned earlier in terms of the overall ecology of um, in, in, in diseased individuals. So in, in Parkinson's disease patients, we see differences. And the question now, of course, is whether specific molecules are involved. And so here we teamed up with Britt Mollenhauer and Wolfgang Oechtel, who are basically movement disorder specialists in Germany. And, and we've looked at many different uh, individuals, uh, including individuals that are not necessarily yet af uh, affected by Parkinson's disease, but that have a condition that affects their sleep and therefore have a very high risk of developing Parkinson's disease. And so we threw our whole um, analysis at this and what we found was that the clearest discriminant feature between healthy individuals and those either with the um, with the precursor of the disease and then the actual disease was at the time an unknown metabolite. And it turns out that after having done a lot of work on trying to identify this, it turns out to be a molecule called 2-hydroxypyridine. And we have since done more validation on this, also quantification on this, and the difference is still apparent. And so if you just take 2-hydroxypyridine and you do a Google search to 2-hydroxypyridine Parkinson's disease, you will see that a similar moiety has actually been linked to trigger the, fold, the misfolding of these proteins that are forming these clumps in the neuronal cells that is this classical molecular hallmark of the disease. And so um, immediately we were struck by this. And so we teamed up with a number of colleagues at LCSB. So this is on the left-hand side uh, data from Carol Linster's lab. And then on the right-hand side, you see data from Jens Schramborn's lab. And what is uh, apparent is that uh, you can use this molecule, uh, again, that we've identified in the gut of um, healthy and diseased individuals, if you can use this to trigger this classical molecular hallmark of the disease. So you can actually trigger this formation of clumps in, in cells. And so our current working model on this is because the origin of this molecule could be primarily twofold. It could be actually input from the environment as a as a toxin for example but we find uh, very little evidence if none in our data that this is involved but what we definitely have now is uh, rather conclusive evidence uh, that actually this is the result of specific organisms having specific functions in the microbiome and so this is for us super super exciting uh, it is a validation of the approach and uh, we obviously hope that uh, this will um, be confirmed now also in animal experiments that we are doing. We have preliminary data that absolutely is suggestive of the fact uh, that this molecule can also induce the pathological process in the brain, for example. And so now the, the key question will be is whether we can use this information to come up with new treatments uh, for the disease and whether we can also tr um, identify uh, changes very, very early on and, and thereby uh, possibly intervene, for example, with diet also. Okay, and so to, to understand all of these interactions, uh, so again, I've shown you now a single molecule that is the result of microbial functions in the gut. To understand what effect these molecules may have then on human cells, so for example here, epithelial cells, again, these are the first cells that any microbial molecule would see in the gut. What we have done is we have developed a system to allow representative studies, and, and this is a system that is called HUMIX, which stands for Human Microbial Crosstalk. Uh, 
And with this system, what we're able to do is we're able to, on the uh, representative conditions, we're able to culture bacteria, for example, with simulated medium that would reflect, for example, a diet rich in fiber. We can co-culture bacteria with human cells, again, for example, with the epithelial cells, but also more recently immune cells, and are thereby able then to look at the interactions between bacteria, human cells, and for example, in the context of Parkinson's disease, we have also the link to the organism that produces this molecule. So we are in the process of thinking of how we can include it here to see then if it's producing the molecule, what effect does that have on the underlying cells and in particular neuronal cells that we are also now able to culture in the system. So that's all nice and well to have such a system what we're able, uh, what we're all about, of course, is doing science and we want to understand really the links between the microbes and then diseases. And I'll just give you one very short example of how we've used the technology. So this humic system to look at, for example, colorectal cancer in the context of the interaction between diet. So this is mostly fiber or typically referred to as a prebiotic and probiotics. Probiotics are organisms that you are all familiar with because a lot of the yogurts that you can buy in the supermarket would have such organisms contained therein. So here we used a specific uh, probiotic and we were interested in whether the interaction between the fiber and then this particular probiotic, whether that could have actually a beneficial effect on colorectal cancer progression and also whether it may have an effect in how you would treat the cancer. And indeed, we found this. So uh, we found that there are uh, clearly a beneficial effects that are conferred by having this interaction between a given dietary component and then a given beneficial organism. And I highlighted now the work on Parkinson's disease. So to understand also there, then the causal uh, links between uh, differences in functions and then how these may trigger the ensuing pathogenic processes. Um, we have also more recently succeeded in culturing so nerve cells in humics, where we can now investigate these questions of, for example, get it having a gut feeling. We can now investigate this at the molecular level. And this is in fact what we have done, for example, with collaborators in the US where we've been able to validate findings around memory. So whether you have, you can remember things more or less well. Um, at the molecular level, we've been able to um, look at this and, and it turns out that indeed also uh, molecules produced by microbes can have an effect on how well uh, you remember things. So um, I've given you this as a model for Parkinson's disease. And the essence here is that there is, of course, uh, possible inputs from the environment as well as from the microorganisms in and on us. And basically, to uh, understand this in a broader sense, we also need to understand that there are, of course, interactions between these microbes. Because, for example, you ingest microbes through the diet. And therefore, it's important to also look at the environment. And then we have also animals that we can come into contact with that themselves have their microbiomes. And a concrete example of why this really matters from a, a microbiome perspective is the current pandemic that we're living through. Because the reservoirs for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and this is a microorganism, right? The reservoir for that is in fact bats or pangolins. And so if we want to understand our own ecology in the context of the microbes, it's clear that we need to look at other environments as well. And that is what is reflected in uh, One Health. So One Health is interested in understanding the interactions between these different reservoirs in relation to human health and well-being. And so, of course, we've lived through the pandemic. Um, it's through basically having now molecular methods available in testing, for example, that we've been able to use, for example, for large scale testing, that we've been able to get a very broad understanding of, for example, how the virus moves through the human population here in Luxembourg. And we've been able to use that information to, for example, suppress epidemic dynamics, as some of you 
uh, may be familiar with. So I'm not going to dwell on this. I just wanted to highlight that something that um, emerged from probably an animal reservoir in China has affected our whole lives over the past year. And without the molecular methods that I've, some of which I've described, we wouldn't have such an intricate understanding and we would have a pandemic that would be far worse than what we have actually experienced, as bad as it has been. So I'd just like to finally uh, highlight just that where we are going with all of this is that we are still continuing to look within and on the human body in relation to the microbes there. But we're also interested in understanding these interactions. For example, what a pangolin reservoir in China might have uh, uh, on, uh, as an effect on our health. And, and so for this, again, we need new methods. Uh, we have developed a, a new um, computer program for this that's called PathoFact, which has, for example, highlighted again that there are functional differences in the context of Parkinson's disease. And so the idea is really to take this out of the human context and also into the environment and to start not just understanding the complex interactions within ourselves, but also how complex interactions outside of ourselves have an in effect on human health. And so one of the projects uh, that is really trying to get at the molecules is, um, for example, my ERC project, where we are specifically looking at the millions of biomolecules that are produced by the microorganisms uh, in and on us, uh, of which the vast, vast majority is currently unknown. And they are also unknown in relation to the triggering, for example, of the immune system and how, again, differences uh, may be the cause of inflammation. Chronic inflammation is again one of the key hallmarks of all of the diseases that I just highlighted earlier. So that leaves me at the end and I just hope that if anything uh, listening to me today has uh, proven to you how important microbes are and how important it is uh, for our own health and well-being as well as all aspects actually of, of human life, that we need to get a better understanding uh, of them. Because as it is quoted in this report, basically they do rule the world and we're definitely secondary to them. And we need to understand how they affect our health, but also how they affect planetary health in one way or another. And this is particularly relevant in relation to questions around sustainability, global change, et cetera, et cetera. So whatever we understand from the ecology of the gut may be broadly applicable to concepts around what happens, for example, uh, in the biosphere of the planet. So with that, I have a lot of people, of course, to thank, lots of collaborators. I will not go through the whole list I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank them all for great collaborations over the years. And with that, I'm at the end and I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And I've seen that there have been some questions popping up and I would like to, of course, answer those. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Paul, for this like very comprehensive and very detailed uh, talk about the microbiome. And I think everybody really appreciates now the importance of uh, of these microbes and the unseen world around us. Um, indeed, as there's not so much time left, I'll just start with uh, um, depicting those questions which already occurred, which we can keep the answers crisp as possible. If there are further questions, feel free to add in the chat. May we just start uh, questions regarding the beginning of your talk when you were mentioning that the antibiotics or lifestyle and all this use in the industrialized world really affects this as well. But what does it actually do with the microbiome and why this is dangerous? And does this also apply to other things like vitamins or other supplements, which we also intake with our food? Yeah, so generally speaking, I mean, what we have done through uh, the chronic overuse of antibiotics, again, since the time of the end of the Second World War, is that we have broadly limited diversity because we have put on a pressure to select only for organisms that would not be susceptible to these antibiotics. So that's something that we've done across the whole human population, in especially Western, uh, uh, Western countries. Um, on an individual level, um, you have very clear diseases that are the result of the overuse of antibiotics. And a very classical one is a Clostridium difficile uh, 
infection in the gut. Because what you've done is basically you've used too many antibiotics, you've only uh, allowed that organism to grow, and it turns out that that is a pathogen. So basically pathogens in particular um, are pathogenic because they have a means of growing faster um, or faster than the other organisms. And if you're using antibiotics, you're providing a benefit to them, right? And so that is indeed what an overuse of antibiotics uh, uh, results in. Generally speaking, it has an effect on diversity. That ha It has an, uh, an effect on diversity in you as an individual, but it has also had an effect on diversity across the whole human population. All right. Um, another question regarding um, some of the, let's say, diseases you were mentioning, not, so not the ones which you were talking about, but which uh, affects our society as well, is the, the fact of obesity. So people who are not necessarily um, gaining weight uh, through an unhealthy lifestyle, but uh, due to uh, um, impaired metabolism, for example. Is it possible that um, the microbiome also affects this and that you, for example, can even transplant the stool from one patient to another to basically improve this uh, burning fat and how sustainable is that? Yeah, so this is a great question and, and, and that, that's actually where the first real links were made between uh, basically an altered uh, microbiome and then a disease. And that was in the context of uh, indeed obesity and type two diabetes. And um, Manuel, as you highlighted, um, the experiments which were done there were, for example, using fecal transplantation to reverse uh, the obesity uh, condition. And this does work. And um, indeed it is also being used uh, now as an intervention in medicine. So where you have fecal transplantations being done on individuals that are not responding to the classical treatments um, and uh, with, with rather high efficacies. The, the, uh, the reason behind all of that is for the most part not entirely yet understood. But bear in mind that this whole field in essence has only really grown over the last decade. And so, I mean, we will of course need more time to really understand all of the intricacies but at the moment, this is already resulting in clear ways of treating diseases such as obesity. Interesting. Um, another topic which was uh, concerning some questions is about uh, the C-section delivery and about the, the birth uh, topic, basically, which uh, concerns many people, I think, in their everyday lives. So um, one is uh, if it's interesting to do a C-section to avoid the baby, to uptake pathogens or microbes from the mother, and along those lines also about the vaginal seeding for babies by the C-section, if this is used in many hospitals already. Now the, so the vaginal seeding is not used widely. Uh, there was only really a report last year uh, that's from the Netherlands where they have indeed done this kind of inoculation of a C-section delivered infant with a sample from the mother. Now, the findings that we've made, and that is actually aligned with the findings of that same group in, in, the, in the Netherlands, is in fact that the majority of the relevant organisms do not come from the vagina of the mother, but actually from the gut of the mother. And we don't understand really how the transfer occurs, but I mean, anybody that is, has lived through a live birth will understand uh, how this can come about. Um, so there is a transfer, obviously, of gut organisms from the mother to the infant at the time of birth. And so the, the idea of restoring um, the kind of transfer um, is indeed uh, possible, uh, as was demonstrated uh, by, by the Dutch team. And uh, this is something that I'm sure will be done in future. Uh, although there are, of course, also some risks associated with this, so one will have to see um, how this evolves. But I'm fairly confident that um, in, not too, in the not too distant future, this will become absolute common practice for C-section delivered infants. A follow up question on this also is uh, if any effects of this C section delivery are also mitigated by the breastfeeding subsequently. So, this is affecting yeah. the microbiome. No, we don't see that breastfeeding um, actually has uh, uh, an effect of reverting this. Uh, what we do see is that uh, at weaning, there is a normalization of the microbiome. So, the introduction of solid food has an, a kind of a normalizing effect. Although 
to some to to a large extent i would say but not entirely you know wiping out everything that would have occurred before as we see from our one year data there are still some uh, differences that we can relate back to what occurred at the time of the earliest colonization. So again, weaning has the greatest effect, breastfeeding doesn't have an immediate effect. Okay, I see. Um, then we just received a couple of more questions regarding our grown up adult microbiome and how we can uh, interfere with it basically. So. One question was a vaccination in general, and in particular, of course, the, the COVID vaccination anyhow might also interfere the biome which we carry with us, the microbiome. Yeah, so this is something, of course, that that, that may be uh, indeed uh, may, might occur because you, you are, of course, uh, through vaccination, you, you do affect your immune system at that moment in time. You, you stimulate it, for example, and, and that may in turn have an effect on your microbiome. But so far, there's no studies that have shown that this has a huge effect. If anything, this is really quite marginal. And the other aspect that is also important to bear in mind here is that the microbiome, by constantly producing all of these molecules that stimulate the immune system, that is also absolutely important that you even you know, have an immune system that then is able to respond to the vaccine. So the two, in essence, also go hand in hand in order for you to be immunized against a virus such as SARS-CoV-2. All right. Um, another manipulation or interference with our microbiome, which is probably less invasive. You're mentioning as well that many of this of, of these yogurts with the probiotic cultures and this uh, um, things we also uh, ingest. Um, do they have a positive effect or a negative effect, or do such cultures have any effect at all on the general composition of a microbiome, or can they influence this at any hour, or is it basically just advertisement to have this yogurt with these cultures? Yeah, I mean, that one has to also differentiate that one probiotic is not necessarily the same as the other probiotic. Um, and what I would say is that uh, for the most part uh, in the dairy industry, the uh, probiotics that are oftentimes found in, in yogurts, for example, uh, they grow well in milk, right? I mean, that is what they use them for uh, in the sense of producing yogurt. That doesn't mean that they grow well in the gut. But by growing in milk and not producing harmful molecules, these molecules that you're then ingesting, they may have actually beneficial, for example, anti-inflammatory effects that has been uh, shown. But what I would say is that we are also on the on the brink of a new era in probiotics, and that is that uh, there are a number of companies uh, in this space now that are developing third and fourth generation probiotics. And these probiotics are not necessarily organisms that grow well in milk, but these are organisms from the gut, for example, of healthy individuals that have then been put together in a cocktail and the cocktail is able to restore through the interactions between the different microbes specific functions. And this is what is going to be, you know, um, on the market in the not too distant future. And these will also be marketed even as drugs in some senses uh, to treat um, conditions. We talked about, for example, obesity. They will also be applied in the context of, for example, inflammatory bowel disease and, for example, also the recurrent Clostridium difficile. Uh, infections. Yeah, with this, you answered actually already almost the, the next question um, about the reseeding methods of the microbiome after strong antibiotic treatment, for example. So, if you, for whatever reason, for example, due to an antibiotic treatment, you will destroy or you will interfere with your microbiome if there's the reseeding possibility, which possibilities exist there, and what is the, um, the time scale, so the delay until this might be restored, so how fragile this is, so to say. Yeah, what, what has been shown is that typically after an antibiotic treatment, in other than, of course, having a very prolonged one that would lead to a situation, for example, that I mentioned earlier in, in terms of a C. diff uh, infection, that is a multi-resistant organism that you're then selecting for. Other than that type of scenario, what has been shown is that the microbiome is able to recover, but that can take on the order of six months. And in order to accelerate this process and to enrich for more, let's say, beneficial organism, 
organisms over that time. That's where a healthy diet, uh, one that is rich in fruit and vegetables in particular, can of course be very helpful uh, because it's that type of diet that would then allow the more beneficial organisms to grow up faster. All right. And then I just saw a last question coming in the chat um, about the internationality, about the, the problems. So how much do you consider in your research the microbiomes of the different people from different parts of the world and how even their diet as people in different countries eat different things also uh, might affect the, the microbiome? Yeah, this is a very relevant question uh, because um, indeed what I have talked about mostly, in fact, is the microbiome of uh, of people here in Luxembourg. Uh, we are also working with collaborators in Germany, as I mentioned, in other countries as well. And of course, uh, these are for the most part actually industrialized countries. There have been some there has been some work on, for example, looking at the microbiomes of hunter gatherers in in the Amazonas, for example. And there you see that these organisms have much more diversity. There's many differences, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm trying to get at with this is indeed Lifestyle and diet primarily does have an effect. And as I mentioned, over the course since the Industrial Revolution, we have affected the microbiome in our westernized uh, countries. And so it is important that one puts the differences that one might find into context. But that's where uh, the, the, the era of science that we're living in, where everybody has to share also their data when they publish, is so vital. Because what we are able to do is to compare our results to, for example, data that colleagues in North America might have generated or in Japan, for example, and thereby are able to see whether these differences may hold, whether these, this might be a general signature or if this might be a kind of a European signature, I'd say. So, yeah, this is absolutely vital that we compare, of course, and it is the case that a uh, diet lifestyle has a massive effect. Right. Um, just another question coming in. Um, apart from the effect uh, towards Parkinson and the microbiome, is Alzheimer's also playing a role? Yes. So, uh, I mean, there, there's also other groups. I mean, we're not specifically uh, working on Alzheimer's, but yes, there is active, active research also on Alzheimer's, uh, which is a condition that um, is not too dissimilar in some ways from Parkinson's because also there you have these aggregations or clumps of specific proteins that are formed. In that case, it's a different protein. But um, so there are also questions there, for example, if this molecule that we found could also trigger the formation of clumps in that case of the proteins involved in Alzheimer's disease. So these are all, you know, open questions at the present, but it's super exciting, of course. Yes, I agree. Um, good. I think I have all the questions for now. Um, if there are no further questions, I would just thank you very much again, Paul. I think you really made us Excellent. appreciate the microbiome more and uh, maybe change the view how we see this uh, unseen world around us and inside of us because it's really fascinating and uh, many aspects. Yes, thanks again for being here. Yeah, thanks a lot. And um, remember to treat it well and that microbes matter.